What's up everybody, Pete the Hybrid Guy here, and today we have a real treat for you on the channel. I just bought a $800 Junkyard Special, and it doesn't run. So we're going to dive in and take a look at this thing and see what it needs to get it going. Now, I just happened to stumble upon this Prius uh, on Facebook Marketplace, and uh, actually it wasn't even that I stumbled upon it. I saw that there was a guy on there who collects junk cars, so I reached out to him and said, do you have any hybrids? And he said, actually, I do. So I went out, I saw it. It already started disassembling it a bit, but it's complete and it does power on. Um, but for us to get any sort of data or anything out of this car, we have first got to figure out this battery situation. So let's get some power here and see what we can come up with. Okay, so I've got a battery charger hooked up back there. Um, I've got power to the car. But what happens when I go to start the car is, you see the ready light comes on, it blinks and then shuts right off. So immediately I know that I've got some errors. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna hop into the mobile diagnostics lab over there. I've got my uh, VPeak Bluetooth um, deal hooked up in here. So we're gonna jump over there, leave this car on, and read the codes to see where we need what to start. What I do have here is just an Android head unit, but I've taken my um, I've taken my Bluetooth dongle and I put it over into the uh, you know the junkyard find, and we're going to connect to it via Bluetooth and see what we come up with. So what I'm going to be using today is the Torque Pro app. Actually, first let's just check the battery status with Dr. Prius. So we'll hit our V peak. This will give us at least some intel on how the hybrid battery is doing. And uh, we'll give us some, oh, wow, yeah. So no Delta SOC shows battery state of charge is 60%, but it looks like we have a real dead uh, set of modules right there. I would bet that's why it is causing the, yeah, and we're not even up to our, our voltage is fluctuating rapidly there. So let's see what we have as far as trouble codes. Here in Dr. Prius, we can just hit special features and we can read battery errors. Oh, wow, look at that. So we've got a P3000, 3004, and a P0 AFA. So we've got a bunch of different things that are going on here. Let's see if we have any engine errors. We don't uh, have any engine data at this time in there. So we're gonna jump out of here. So I went back into Dr. Prius before I, I had, I'm heading over to the car and what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing that this set of modules right there just falling right off and they're causing the pack voltage to just drop way below anything that is required of a starting value. So I have an idea and I think here is what I'm going to do. I think what I need to do is get my prolonged charger and hook it up to the high voltage battery and then just charge and give it a, a balance. And I really think that will probably give the pack enough health to uh, turn over and start again. So that's what I'm gonna do is get that prolonged battery charger hooked up now and uh, then we'll get this thing charging and check on it when it's ready. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, if you don't own one of these uh, prolonged battery chargers, I'm not trying to sell you on it, but if you're out rescuing Priuses and you do happen to come across a P0 uh, AFA, sorry, um, where it says battery is too low on voltage, I can tell someone's been in here, right? That's, those are not factory markings. I know someone has tried to fix this battery. So we're going to hook up the charger right over there and we're gonna give this thing a proper charge. So I had to grab up my trusty Fluke 88.5 to ensure I knew exactly where to hook the leads up to. The top one up there is negative and the bottom one right there is positive. So I'm gonna hook those up now and then we will get this hooked up and be sure to remove your safety plugs so you do not injure yourself. 
Now what I do when I hook up my prolonged chargers, I do this now because it doesn't arc when I do it, is I hook up the high voltage cable, I hook up the power that's gonna feed it, and then very last, I will put the service plug in. And I do it that way because how hybrid automotive was telling you to just was to connect this last but it was arcing all the time and it was actually causing some internal failures and fuses blowing inside so i just don't do that anymore and i do it this way so i thought i would do a little bit of inspection and i definitely think we're going to be rebuilding this battery like no matter what but i've got to be able to at least turn it on and so I can move it around and see if there's any other codes or anything that come up from it. So what I'm doing right now, um, I'm going to now turn on the Prolong. We've got our high voltage connection in there. And that is not a good sign at all. That means we've got a fault somewhere and I've got to check that out. So hang tight. So something is weird here because my charger isn't charging. So I'm going to do some investigative diagnosis. I think somebody has taken the cover off and they've tried to figure out how to remove some of these. But I don't know because I didn't look under there yet. But let's grab a pick and see if somebody has been tampering with our battery. Well, there's problem number one. Problem number one is right there. That doesn't even have a screw on it. So I'm wondering if that is what is causing our guy yeah, over here to not work. I'm gonna check the other side after I remove the seats and all this interior stuff out of here and see if anybody's messed with the other side as well. We're gonna figure this out and get this battery charged. All right, so I've got that not replaced right there. And I wanna show you something. I checked this side. We've got some serious hack work going on here so I don't even know if this harness is gonna work for us in the end I do have thankfully I do have someone who can supply me with one um, but let's see if this uh, fixed our problem and allows this to boot up well I guess it might be helpful if I put the safety plug in first okay Safety plug in, that on. No, no, we're not charging at all. Okay, so what in the, sometimes these connections come loose. All right, well, we're gonna have to go to plan B. Okay, so I am not getting any power out of this thing. Something is weird. So I've gotta do some more testing to figure out where exactly my power is going because that's not charging anything. I've got my safety or I've got my lock in there and uh, I'm not reading a dang thing off of this battery. So I've got to do some more digging and uh, I'll come back to you with some results when I find some. Let's get this repaired, get a good battery in here and then we'll go to stage two, which is actually seeing if this thing will fire up and uh, where it's at from there. So here's to what is coming next. Battery's coming out, it's going on the table, and we are going to start diving into this immediately. In the meantime, that battery's charged, so we can take that off the charger. <clears throat> it's not the right battery, uh, but it's you know one other thing in the myriad of problems in this junkyard Prius. So, but so I've got to capture some of the ridiculousness of this like so these bolts aren't really even they work but they're not the right ones we've got a conglomerate of like wrong hardware our vent tube wasn't even hooked up properly the upper uh, vent that went in there which is jammed in here it had smushed this up in there whoever had been in here messing with this battery previously really sucked at it and uh <laughs> I just think it's comical at this point now, like, I've just got to laugh at it that I don't even know what I'm getting into for the, the amount of money that I paid for this car. I mean, it's wrecked. You can see that there's been, you know, damage back there that's been repaired. Like, the tires are bald on this car. Like, uh, I mean, just all sorts of, like, Mickey Mouse garbage. So, anyway, just had to give you that update of, like, 
random things that I'm finding that are just going to make this video all that more interesting if we can get this thing to come back to life. So. Okay, so battery is out of the car. We've got the Prolong module tester we're going to be using. Um, and really what we're going to do is we're going to strip all of this off of here, all these bus bars, and it's got to go through a cleaning process. Now, if you remember, uh, on this other side, we had some real janky stuff going on i mean we've got solder joints and all that and i just don't trust this harness so i reached out to a friend of mine a fellow battery builder that is sending me a new harness and all new bus bars new nuts all of that we're going to start fresh with all of this as much as we possibly can because we have to have a known good battery in order to figure out if this car is even going to work right so i've got a new harness coming We'll get the new harness on there. Um, but before we do any of that, we're checking all these modules. Uh, so all of this is coming off, of course. And then we'll check all the modules, see where everybody's at, see if we need to replace any. And then we'll get this on our Prolong charger. And then we'll just do our battery reconditioning and get this back in the car as soon as we can to see if we can get this thing to start. I'm hoping you can see, but right there, is corrosion on that pin so that's also going to give us uh, a big problem so now i've got to see if i can either clean up that pin uh, which is going to require me to disassemble this ecu or if i've got to get another ecu and conveniently oh, there is the part number right there so maybe we can get lucky and uh, get this to work so we're starting on uh, first module, we're just going to measure all the voltages first, and then once I've got all the voltage readings down, uh, then I can go in and I can do, I can connect the Prolong Pro up there and start doing uh, testing for internal resistance and start recording numbers. So voltage, internal resistance, and then we'll compare our numbers in our book here and see if any of these modules are even good. Uh, I'm going to next do internal resistance and date these at the same time. Uh, that way I have a known set of data, how old the modules are, what their internal resistance is, and then we can start figuring out which direction we want to head with this pack. Okay, so let's look at what we found. I actually started going from the last month. I had to rewrite my numbers. Uh, just me, but right out of the gate, uh, the first one, even though it measured 7.52 volts, uh, when I did the internal resistance test, it failed immediately. And then we have some fairly high resistance, you know, in the 22 range. Um, and I got another failed module and then another failed module here. They just did not pass that test. Now, what's interesting is these that initially measured at 6.35 volts passed. Interesting. So what I'm going to do, because this is a Prius that I'm really just trying to get back out on the road uh, quickly, I do have three modules. Um, I do have some good ones that I'm going to swap out for these. I'm going to match the resistances as much as possible. And I'm going to take and move all the, the best ones to the middle and put the worst ones on the outside. And then we'll uh, rebuild this pack and get it charging. Um, because realistically, I think what ended up happening is something went finicky with the battery, probably lost one of the modules along the way somewhere, and someone just tried to fix it by fixing it in the car, realizing it was too much of a hassle. Uh, they got rid of the car. And on further inspection, and earlier I said that somebody had been in this battery, and yes, they had, but not to change out modules. This is an original battery pack from 2004. So this definitely has some age and some wear on it, but looking at the numbers, they're not awful. Uh, when I rebuilt the CT pack, I had numbers like this, and you know we got uh, that pack to come back really well and uh, perform really well for us. So I have hope that we can do the same thing here. So what I'm gonna do now is just go through and replace those three failed modules and then I'm going to see if this will take a charge. And if so, great, we'll put it through a reconditioning process and go from there. Okay, after hours of testing modules, I found six in my pack of good ones 
And there are six in here that I've identified that I want to replace. Three are known fail, and then the other three have greater than 22 or greater than 21 ohms of resistance, so in the 22 plus range. The reason I want to do that is because, you know, as old as this pack is, like it's really not super awful. And I, if I go in and replace the you know, ones with higher resistance values in there and get them a more matched pair in this battery, we have a pretty good chance of this succeeding. So my goal here is not to build the perfect pack, it's to build a pack that functions and turns the car on and gets it running. So if I get 50% SOC, um, or sorry, if I get 50% state of health or better, that's going to at least get this car down the road for quite some time. Nickel is uh, pretty robust in that. Um, this would have been, yes, way easier just putting a uh, next power battery in it, but we're trying to do a budget build here on this because this is just a junkyard car. So we're really trying to get it back up and going. Uh, okay, good modules are swapped. Bad modules are out. Let's get the bus bars on here. Let's see, and then, yeah, bus bars, charger, and we'll get this thing charging up for its first run up. And let's get it on a recondition, see how we do. Okay, we have success. So remember when I tried to put my prolonged charger on the battery in the car and it would not charge, it would go straight to 250 volts, would not send any amps in there. And now we are charging 209 volts. So we are definitely needing to come up a little bit to get this thing charged and balanced, but hey, we are moving in the right direction. I don't have... See you know how I was really concerned about corrosion on those pins? Let me show you. Normally, if the corrosion is bad enough, it'll come through here onto the back side, and we don't have any of that. It's actually incredibly minimal, um, and it's right down that bottom pin. Realistically, this board is probably going to be just fine. Now I am getting a new harness, so I'm not going to have any corrosion going up the harness. But I'm going to clean those pins really well, and this ECU should be just fine. So I wanted to get some, I just did my first discharge on this, but there's a lot of misinformation going around on the internet about how fast this charges. Some say, oh, it just, just it uh, releases really slowly, be very careful, and while yes, <clears throat> It does release energy. You need to know exactly what happens when you release this um, service plug. Okay, so here's we've got the meter hooked up. We've got it hooked to the positive and the negative. I'm going to show you exactly what happens, what the car does when you release the service plug. So now that first click is to get it away from the interlock. But when you do this, boom. Oh, look, it goes right to zero. And it does that like that. You know why? Because it splits the battery in half and that there's no longer a connection between the two parts of the battery that uh, that make up the high voltage. And so there's no voltage, no dangerous voltage there immediately for you to, um, for you to be, you know, worried about. Because now it's an open circuit and there is no worry, there's no voltage at the two leads. Can you still? So look at what just showed up today. Uh, my friend up in Spokane, Len with Hybrid CPR had another harness for me, uh, which he sent to me. You can see all of these have nice, clean, beautiful copper bus bars. We are gonna be swapping them out for uh, these uh, nickel coated ones. And we're also gonna use these stainless nuts. We wanna give this battery the best chance of coming back to life. So. Um, no more junk harness. Everything is pretty much brand spanking new on this, um, and I'm excited. So the battery right now is still undergoing its reconditioning process, but when it's done, this is going to go on there, and then we will get this uh, car back up and going. Okay, it is our third and final day. Pack is at 237 volts. Uh, what I need to do now is I need to let this rest for about an hour. So what I'm going to do before I rip all these old bus bars off and put on our new set of bus bars there with our new uh, nickel-plated hardware and stainless nuts. 
Okay, we have got this battery all reassembled. Um, it is ready to go into the car. Had to put, had to find a lot of the hardware that was missing, like out of this ECU, both those bolts were missing because someone had taken them out. And just lots of little things. Uh, I fixed the connection down here, made sure uh, my connection here to the HV circuit uh, was free of corrosion. And then of course this whole sensing bar on this side um, it has, the, has the new sensor wires. There's the old janky one that had the busted sensor wires. So we're leaving that out. We've got a new one on there. This battery is ready to put in the vehicle now and get things hooked up so we can see if this car actually starts. Okay, battery's in. I'm still finding all the pieces. I am missing some pieces, but this will give us enough to at least turn it on. So I'm gonna connect my safety plug, make sure that my interlock is in, all that's connected. I've gotta find some temporary connections for this. I'm gonna check the oil and then we'll fire this thing up, hopefully. Okay, check the oil, we've got oil. I've temporarily hooked up the 12 volt battery and now it is time to see if this thing will start and I'm really hoping that it will. That's a good sign. Let's put on the brake. Oh my gosh, we're in ready. Cool, that's half the battle. gonna happen when it starts though. I don't know. Shoot, motor sounds good. Battery's looking healthy. No immediate trouble code, so that's a bonus. Oh my gosh, I think we have a winner. Oh, it is humming right along. <laughs> that is awesome. Oh, I cannot tell you how good that feels right now to have that battery fixed and to have this thing turn on and just not have any massive engine noise. Like, that is so good. Okay, I've got a crap load of work to do, um, including replacing a, a battery in this key fob, but at 265,000 miles, um, yeah, we're doing it. So problem one, down, and uh, let's move on to the next thing. Then, Okay, so the goal for today is to fix these terminals right now and also start putting all this back together. I've currently misplaced my other two plastic caps, and so I haven't put this on yet because they're in here somewhere. Now, I believe they were missing when I got it because most of this was disassembled. But regardless, we gotta fix this so I can have constant power up to my dash so we can actually take this car for a test drive and see how it performs. So I got marine style connectors. This one will be easy. And I have an idea on how I'm going to uh, retrofit that one, but I'll show you in a minute uh, what I've done on how to make these work. So if you want to switch over to a lead acid battery, you can. I'm just trying to avoid spending $200 on an OE battery versus like $6 for terminals. That's a good battery. It is currently holding charge and the car can turn on and off. Um, so I wanna keep it in there and not have to incur that additional cost. Remember this is... Okay, I wanna show you what I did uh, to modify the negative terminal so in case the person ever wanted to go back to an OE battery they could. I got a marine terminal and then I put a couple of nuts on them and then tightened that down really well. So you can see, come on focus for me, there we go. You can see the nuts in there and then I just clamped that around which is about the same size as an OE battery post anyway and then we can use our same fitting right there to go back on to the car. So this is now our new negative post. We go right on there and that will still, this will allow us to use a different style of battery that has bigger posts. Um, but also, you know, keep this budget friendly too, right? Cause this is our, our junkyard Prius. So let's get these in the car, get everything secured down. And that way we can turn the car on 
and uh, at least go for a drive at this point. Well, we've got one problem already. We've got no blower fan. I turned the AC on to try and cool down in here because we're going for a test drive, but uh, as you can see, my fan is supposed to be spinning and we've got nothing. Also, my AC compressor sounds absolutely horrendous. So hopefully that is, uh, oh man. Well, we'll figure that out at another juncture. Anyway, let's go for a test drive. Well, that didn't take too long. We got uh, about a mile and a half down the road and then we got a check engine light. So other than that, the car seems to be driving really well, um, but we gotta get back and figure out what this check engine light's all about and see what on earth we're gonna do about it. So let's go take a look. We need to go to our Torque Pro, which is right here. And because that car, because the uh, that car is on and should be sending us a Bluetooth signal. We're just gonna wait till it connects up here. Even though it says profile is for the CT, we are going to hit our Diag and tap here to scan for faults. That's what we're doing. So let's see what code came up. Sensor there. Okay, so looks like we've probably got a sensor circuit or something. Now, when I was out driving it, I could hear there might just be an exhaust leak. So I'm going to have to put that up on a rack to figure that out. Um, what noise was coming out from under there? If it turns out to just be an exhaust leak, we'll have that solved in no time. So. Right now I'm glad that is the only code that we have and we're gonna head, uh, go ahead and close that out for now. And then... That is no good. That has gotta go in here. So let's get that swapped out with that and make this front end look a little nicer. What's really great about these hoods is they are super easy to swap over because you have one, two, three, four bolts and a line and oh yeah, that's it. And then we're gonna... Now this is what I mean by these bolts being centering bolts. That's what I was trying to say. Is they have this taper at the bottom which allows everything to line up nice and uh, perfectly when it goes in. So you can start these kind of in any pattern and then as it tapers down to this taper, it aligns everything and then the hood fits just like it's supposed to. So if you didn't know that, now you do. And that's... Okay, so the good hood is now installed. It does have a couple little bumps and bruises, but it's way better than what we had on there. Now, putting this on, I did notice a couple things because this had a slight impact in the front. Number one, if you look right there, there is no hood support brace. We're gonna have to find one of those. So, another trip to the junkyard. And number two, that headlight is broken, but I'm pretty sure we can fix that and get that straightened up. So that will allow the hood to close properly and uh, then this front end can start looking like something again. Okay, so I had to test out to see if this blower motor is actually bad or not. And I'm using a device called a power probe. What this allows me to do is hook up power and then command on demand power to whatever it is that I need power to. And believe it or not, that sucker spins when it gets power to it. So really what I think is going on with this blower is not the blower motor itself, but the resistor, um, the resistor block. And what the resistor block does, it allows, it limits the amount of current that flows to the fan and thus adjusts the speed accordingly. So if that resistor block goes out, it can inhibit complete flow or electricity flow to the fan 100%. And looking under there, I can see that somebody has replaced one with a, a junkyard one. We're going to have to find another known good one and test our theory. Luckily, I have a spare Prius and we can do that. So 
I'm going to get a different resistor on this and see if that solves my problem, which I'm I had almost forgot we have got to do a better job at fixing this wire. Um, whoever was in here ripped it out, so they did this nice job of kind of bridging that gap. This is not going to work long term for me. I don't feel comfortable ever selling this car to somebody that's got a janky wire like that just hanging out doing nothing. So um, this. It's got to get fixed now to make a good solder joint you got to prep everything right so I've got the wires cut back I've got my casing my heat shrink on there already I've got flux on there and then I will solder these together and then we'll put that heat shrink over there and uh, wrap this thing up it'll be nice okay now we've got that soldered reheat shrunk and what I ended up doing to help because you know and it's all Helpful to have another hand is I just taped this to the case. But now that's fixed completely. It doesn't have some janky wire hanging out there. And we can put this all back together and know that we have a good secure connection to our hybrid ECU right here. So. Okay, so we're troubleshooting the fan. Um, now I've got the resistor down there and I've got the fan set on high. Now we tested the fan previously with, uh, we jumped it right to power the fan spun. So we're only getting 1.3 volts, which means more than likely we've got a really wicked or, uh, voltage drop somewhere, more than likely caused by corrosion. So we're gonna have to track that down in order to get this system to work. So, but we do have a known good motor because we've tested that. Um, I can see that through the relay, we are getting power um, through from here. And then of course over to our positive side on our fan. So I know that we're flowing power through this relay. It's just not enough to run this motor. So let's figure out where we're dropping all that voltage and get this fan working again. Okay, so I finally figured out what was going on with the blower motor in the junkyard Prius after I've you know, ripped the entire dash out. But what happened is this relay that turns the fan on, there's gotta be a connection behind here where this is because I can move this terminal on the bottom there, and I believe it's on the ground side, and this clicks on and then the fan comes on. So, okay, so I got the fuse box out and oh, right there, that's probably our issue. So I think moving this lower pin here is causing an intermittent connection here which I believe feeds the blower motor which is shutting that off and everything else we've got a burned out socket so this whole fuse deal I'm debating I'm gonna open it up and see if we can repair this and repair the connector so that connector is burned on the end as well which is right here it's like what caused that not sure. So I'm going to pop this open, hopefully, and see if I can repair it. Uh, otherwise, we're getting a fuse box. Okay, so update with the junkyard Prius. We found that this terminal right here was the terminal that operates the blower motor. It was blown out. I believe what happened is the fan either went out or the resistor went out and the previous owner tried to put a higher amperage um, fuse in there and blew the circuit completely. But now uh, I've got a new nice tight fitting uh, wire that's gonna go on there. I'm gonna tie this. So on all these Priuses, on these Gen 2s, the springs break out right here on the back side. And so what I do to fix that is just real simple. I drill a couple holes and then I put some zip ties on both sides to hold the springs back into place. And then it actually functions again. So it will actually open as it's designed to. Um, but this happens, it's really common. Uh, punch a hole in there and then you can't tell unless you're really looking for it that those zip ties are actually there. So you really will never actually know. Um, but that fixes this glove box, which they all do it.
Okay, so this car is mostly back together. Uh, the fan works now, which is awesome. We've just been putting trim back in. And man, what a huge improvement over having all this come to me in just pieces. It is a little dirty, but you know, it's complete and it runs. And so far everything seems to be working, which is amazing. So this initial $800 investment seems pretty good. And uh, you know, I'm into it right now, probably about $1,100 with all the parts and uh, everything else that I've needed to get it to this point. I have some good used tires we're gonna put on it here and I do need to uh, get my front bumper stitched back together. Uh, but for the most part, you know, this car came into me not running, it was in pieces, and it's almost 100% again, and it'll be ready for uh, a new owner here pretty soon. Okay, so we went out on a test run, and it's noisy in here because the tires are terrible, but we went out on a test run to see how the junkyard Prius was going to work. Now, I did do a lot of work on the battery. Um, however, we just got an error code P3000, which is a generic code. So I'm going to have to get the deeper codes out of this. It, I'm hoping it's not a P0A80 replaced battery pack because I was just looking at my Dr. Prius data and the battery is really well balanced. It is actually in in good shape so I'm wondering if the fan for the battery has corrosion on the terminals uh, at the connector which a lot of times can trigger a P3000 so I'm gonna get the other codes off of this and see if that is the case part okay so the error code um, it hasn't come back yet. I think what may have happened is I may have left the high voltage fan plug unplugged. So that could be the cause. Uh, I've been driving this around for a bit. I haven't had the P3000 code come back. I'm going to do some errands in it today and see if it does come back. Um, I'm hoping it doesn't. If it does not, great. But uh, we will see. So another. Th so we're almost done with the junkyard Prius. I decided to kind of leave that bumper on there, and the reason I'm doing that is because again, this is a budget car. It runs, it drives, it you know, it's it hooks in well. It looks a little ugly, but you know, mm, it's okay. It's gonna work. Um, so one of the things that I like to do, because this car is going to. Uh, it's already sold to somebody. They want it. They really don't care uh, about this. But, you know, what I like to do is I like to add value where I can to the customer. So these headlights are driving me crazy. Now, I just did a really nice job on this white Prius that is also sold. And we're going to do that same process here to these headlights to get them to look like that. Nice, crisp, and new. So I'm gonna walk you through my process of what that is, and then we'll dive in and we'll look at the before, of course, and then the after results, which should yield us something like this. So, so everybody has their own process. Um, doing this over the years, I've come to figure a few things out, and the process that I like best is the method that I'm going to show you today. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start out and I, I do everything wet sand now. I don't do any dry sanding. Um, you know, I'm. that's what I have found works best for me and the results, again, are really good. So uh, I think this process does speak for itself and really what it comes down to is it's a process. So you have to think in terms of steps. So I start out with something that is a little rough but not too rough. I don't want to gouge the headlight. I just want to be able to take off the surface there. So I start with a 320 and I wet sand that. And I go over the headlight probably about five, six times and I rinse in between every time I go over it to get all the debris off. Then I move up to a 400, same thing, uh, five to six times, then a thousand, then 1500, and then I finish 
the sanding portion with a wet sand of a 3000 um, 3M disc. And this used to go on my drill and I used to, I used to just, you know, do it by hand. And for some applications, I still will use a drill, but I found that getting your hands in there and really working each individual spot just yields a better result. And then what I do is I will take the ultra cut compound and polish it out hundred percent and then protect it with a headlight sealer and that will give us a really good result. And I usually do about two coats of the headlight sealer. So let's get this process started and get those headlights looking like new. Now it is helpful to note, you're not gonna get every perfection out of a really old headlight. And as you can see, there's a lot of like stress cracks and stuff that are going on here, but it's still going to polish up really well. So I just finished up with the 320 grit. I'm gonna hit this with the next uh, 400,000, 1,500, and 3,000. And then I'll show you once I get to the 3000, how much clearer that this light's gonna look without even a polish. And then once we polish it, you'll see the difference in how uh, well this process works. So just went over it with the 3000 grit, but look at the color of this one as opposed to this one. We can see there's yellowing in here. Now this headlight is not fully polished yet. I'm gonna do that now. Um, and actually I'm gonna go over it a couple more times with the 3000 and just get it really dialed in and then I'm gonna hit it with the polisher and we'll take a look and see what the result is. Really, the results speak for themselves. Now, as I mentioned before, you're gonna see all the imperfections in the headlights. These have just, you know, heat stress fractures and cracks. So they're not gonna be, so they're not gonna be 100%, um, but they are going to really give us a much better shine, especially when you comparison you know, do a comparison to the other side that's hazy and cloudy. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to, while we work on the other one, we're going to coat this one with the sealer and it'll end up getting two coats of sealer. Uh, but I've got to hurry up here because uh, the sun is going down. And I want to get this done before it gets too cold out. So, okay. So we got our new uh, smart key now. These are aftermarket, so they don't have the silver logo on them, but luckily for this one, I do. I've already uh, got one, one key. Whenever I put a car together for somebody else, make sure that we have a minimum of two keys. And uh, it has a little S there for a smart key. Uh, the great thing, and the link is in the description for this key, uh, is they give you the instructions on how to do it. It's so easy. Uh, so really all I'm going to do is just follow these instructions, uh, which is inserting the new key into the slot, taking it out, opening and closing the door, doing the lock sequence on this, and just follow these instructions. What's also nice is there's a QR code right there on how to do this. It is really straightforward. I wanted to put that in here because I'm not going to show the actual process of doing it, but if you can read and or follow this QR code here, you can 100% program this key fob for your Prius. So, all right, I wanna wrap up this video by just giving an overview really quickly of the $800 Junkyard Prius. We've got it up and going, everything is good. We've got no trouble codes. Uh, and I'm gonna sit inside here because it's a little bit warmer than it is outside. And we've got a blower motor that's working again. We now have two keys for the vehicle. Um, it's cold outside, so we've got our defrost on, but everything works and functions as it once did. It's not a new car, but it is a car that runs and drives really well. We've got uh, some good tires in the back for the, uh, for the new owners that are picking it up tonight. And overall, I'm really, really happy with the result. So I want to take a moment and thank everybody that has watched this video. I know it was a little bit longer than some of my other videos, but it's to illustrate a point. It's to illustrate that just because something's destined for the salad jar doesn't mean that it is 100% garbage. And this Prius is living, running, and driving proof of that. And also, everything is fixable to an extent, right? Not everything is 
needs to be fixed. Some things do need to go to the scrapyard. But I want to thank you all again. If you like this video, please like, share, subscribe, ask questions. Like I'm happy to interact with any of my followers if you have questions about Prius or other hybrids. Um, I don't just do Prius, I do other hybrids as well. I focus a lot on Prius because it is uh, one of the biggest ones out there. But again, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, I really do appreciate the feedback that I get from the community and that helps me better serve you. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.